Good morning and welcome to today's Engage session. Today we'll be talking about Mars sample return, the first step of which was last week's successful landing of the Perseverance rover. My name is Laura Bleacher and I'm from Goddard's Office of Communications. Also with me from the Office of Communications, but behind the scenes today, are Bree Horton and Travis Woolrab, making this all work. So thank you, Bree and Travis. Our office sponsors the Engage series so that Goddard employees may better understand the center's contributions to NASA's mission, um, especially so that employees can understand the work that takes place outside of their normal area. So we greatly appreciate your participation and interest today. Before we get started, I do have a little bit of housekeeping to cover. We'll hold question and answers until all three of today's speakers have presented. If you have a question, please type it in the chat box. For closed captioning, hover over the video and press the CC button in the bottom right. If you don't see those options, the chat box or the CC button, you may want to try opening the presentation link in a different browser. For me personally, it works best in Chrome. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our three speakers. First, we'll hear from Dr. Dr. Barbara Cohen, who is a planetary scientist in our Solar System Exploration Division and a returned sample scientist for the Perseverance mission. She has also been a member of the science teams operating the Mars rovers Spirit, Opportunity, and Curiosity. In addition to her Mars roles, she's a principal investigator on multiple NASA research and spaceflight projects, including Lunar Flashlight, a lunar CubeSat mission that will be launched later this year as a secondary payload aboard Artemis I, and the Peregrine Ion Trap Mass Spectrometer manifested aboard the Astrobotic Peregrine Lander for a lunar surface mission later this year. She is also PI for the Mid-Atlantic Noble Gas Research Laboratory at Goddard. Next up will be Brendan Feehan. Brendan is a systems engineer in the Mission Systems Engineering Branch, Code 599, and is currently the Project Systems Engineer for the Mars Sample Return Missions Capture Containment and Return System, or CCRS. CCRS is the payload hosted on an ESA-provided spacecraft that will capture a canister of samples in Mars orbit, package for safe return to Earth, and return the samples safely. And we'll be hearing a lot more about that today. And last but not least is Dr. Daniel Glavin. Dr. Glavin is the Associate Director for Science in the Solar System Exploration Division at Goddard and studies the organic composition of meteorites and other extraterrestrial materials. He is a co-investigator on the OSIRIS-REx Asteroid Sample Return Mission and is a member of the team that is planning how to safely return samples collected by Perseverance to Earth. And with that, we're gonna kick things off with a short video of last week's beautiful landing of the Perseverance rover. We are starting the straighten up and fly right maneuver where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Applicate in the cage, shoot deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 440 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Heat shield set. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Nav filter converged. Velocity solution, 3.3 meters per second. Altitude, 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second, 6.6 .6 kilometers above the surface of Mars. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. OVS valid. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Priming. TBA is nominal. We have priming of the landing engines.
Back shell set. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Sky crane maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. Hi. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Barbara Cohen. I'm a member of the Geology, Geochemistry, and Geophysics Lab here at Goddard. And I'm a returned sample scientist on the Perseverance mission. What that means is I'm a laboratory scientist. I work on samples from the moon and Mars and meteorites. We take them apart in our laboratory. And we learn about their isotopes and their composition and their petrology. And all of those things about the rocks tell us about the history of the planet. One of the greatest things that Perseverance is going to be doing is collecting samples for eventual return to Earth. And so my role in the mission is to use my laboratory expertise to guide what samples to pick up and return to Earth for eventual analysis. And I'm excited to talk to you today about the Perseverance in situ mission. We have a really amazing set of instruments on board Perseverance to help understand the landing site and understand the samples and give them really crucial context so that when we study them back on the Earth, we'll know about more where they came from and can tie them to the surface, surface of the planet. Uh, next slide, please. So I hope many of you saw the press conference yesterday where we released some of these amazing images. This slide really can't do this image justice. This is a, a panorama of the landing site where Perseverance landed. Um, and you can go find this online and you can enlarge it and scroll around. It's pretty amazing. Um, there are scour marks there, sort of in the middle between the two wheels. That's where the dust was scoured away as the uh, retro rockets uh, pushed the dust away um, as we were landing. And then you can see these amazing vistas um, with ripples in the distance, the edge of Jezero Crater, um, and the big delta where we're going um, eventually. Um, next slide, please. That delta is uh, why we picked Jezero Crater for our landing site. This was a community-driven process. We had uh, four big community science meetings where people got to argue for their favorite sites, um, and we winnowed them down. Um, we did a lot of work on them to understand uh, where would be the best place for Perseverance to land. Um, what one was Jezero Crater. Um, this is about three and a half billion year old crater. It's in the Noachian highlands of Mars. That means it's in very ancient terrain near the Isidus Basin. Isidus Basin is one of the biggest impact craters on Mars. It's a couple thousand kilometers across. It's a pretty big basin. Um, so that means this crater is, is ancient. It formed in ancient terrain. But since then, it's been modified. And what you can see on the left is something called Lower Inlet Valley, and on the right is Outlet Channel. That's what really drove us to pick this crater. This means that there are riverine structures or things that may have had flowing water, probably had flowing water. There's one coming into the crater, and then there's one leaving the crater. That means that the water got so high inside Jezero Crater that it could breach the other side and flow out. Whenever we have a big body of water like that, we think that there's going to be delta or sorry sediments that um, form a lake bed. Um, and so that's a really, really good place to go look for ancient uh, signs of life, ancient biosignatures, things that um, life may have left behind. Um, not only that, but on the left hand side there um, where you see the landing ellipse, there's a big land uh, uh, 
ellipse there that says Jezero Crater, right on the left side of that, there's a little uh, a fan there. It's called a delta. That's where the river came in. And as it slowed down, as it opened up into the big crater, um, as that water slowed, it had less carrying capacity and it dropped its sediment. Um, next slide, please. We're going to zoom in on that. This is a false color image showing some of the minerals that we see from orbit um, in that delta region. And so you can see it's a very classic fan. We see these on Earth. We understand that that's when the river comes in and drops its sediment. Um, in those kinds of areas where we have water mixing with very quiet sediment um, and bringing nutrients down from the source highlands, that's a really wonderful place for life. There's a lot of microbial life in these kinds of settings on the earth. Um, they can leave behind filaments or mats um, or burrows that are encased in the rock as more sediment gets washed in. So these are really great places on earth to not only have life there, but to preserve those biosignatures. And that's one of Jezero Crater's big attraction. Um, next slide, please. Um, that'll show you just one of these, ex oh, I guess I didn't show it. So one example on the Earth. Um, so these mission objectives for Perseverance are really, really well met by this crater um, Jezero and the delta that it, that it has there. The Perseverance mission objectives are geology. That's something that we do with all rovers, and that's my main interest. What do we want to learn about the planet, how it formed, how it evolved, how it's different or similar to the Earth? Um, it's hard for us to understand planetary evolution when we only have one example, the Earth. We want to know what the Earth was like in the past. We want to know where it's going. We use other planets to help us understand that. So we want to understand those rivers on Mars. We want to understand the rocks. As I said, astrobiology is a real driving force behind our whole Mars exploration program, and Danny will talk a little more about that later. Um, this is something that Perseverance and all of our rovers look for. In fact, Perseverance is really well equipped to look for uh, ancient signs of life that are uh, not alive today, but may have been alive in the past. Um, and so we look for um, organics and microstructures mostly, um, and that helps us understand past biosignatures, like this picture of an ancient stromatolite. These layers are caused by microbial mats trapping sediment. Um, so those microbes don't live there anymore, but they've trapped sediment um, in their layers and that gets preserved in the rock. As I said, another objective is sampling. We want to bring those samples back to Earth. We're going to collect a little less than 40 of those samples and something like 30 will be returned to Earth eventually. Uh, and you're going to um, hear Brendan talk about that as well. And then we want to prepare for humans. We would like humans to colonize the solar system or spread out and explore the whole solar system. Um, we want to go to the moon, we want to go to Mars, we want to go all over the place. And to do that, we want to understand the planet and how hospitable it is for life and what we need to do to prepare to go there. Um, so we have uh, weather uh, capability on Perseverance um, and we actually have an in-situ resource utilization experiment that I'll describe in a little bit. Um, next slide, please. So I want to talk about what we're going to do in situ, um, the things that we're going to do to characterize the samples using our onboard payload. So Perseverance is built on the Curiosity chassis design. So Curiosity, very successful rover, a very capable rover, much more capable than the Mars Exploration Rover's um, Spirit and Opportunity. Uh, it's got a much bigger mast with a big mast cam on it. It's got a much bigger arm that's got instruments on it. Um, and uh, you may have heard the woes of Curiosity um, with its wheels um, wearing thin because of the hard terrain, so we beefed up those wheels. Um, these are the instruments aboard Perseverance. Um, Mascam Z and Supercam are on top of the mast there. You can see them looking out with the big Cyclops eye. Those are panoramic cameras and a laser um, near infrared libs and ramen system all together so that's why it's a super cam there's our meta weather station we're carrying room facts which is a subsurface uh, ground penetrating radar that we're going to be using to look for layers under the surface as the rover moves moxie is our uh, in situ resource utilization it produces oxygen from co2 and out there on the arm you can see our proximity uh, science instruments which are sherlock which is an ultraviolet spectrometer and Raman system. It's got a little camera in it and called Watson. And Pixel, which is an X-ray spectrometer, um, which takes in uh, data that's like a microprobe or like, a, um, like an APXS. So it takes uh, X-rays of the elemental composition of the rock. 
Next slide, please. So the kinds of investigations that we do while we're using the rover on the surface of Mars um, are we use those mass cam um, instruments, um, mass cam Z and um, LIBS, and we look out at uh, the landscape. We take pictures like this. This is a vista from Curiosity, um, but what it shows you is the different kinds of color that you can get. Um, this is uh, stretched colors, but you can see, you know, redder and purple and bluer kinds of images, kinds of rocks. Let's tell us what those rocks um, are different from each other and tells us where to go to investigate. They're up high so that we can see in stereo. Um, we can take selfies. This is a curiosity selfie, of course, but I'm sure you're going to see more of these for perseverance. Um, that's not only just good PR, it tells us about the state of our rover um, and it tells us about the health of our instruments. Um, and RIMFAX, this is an illustration on the bottom left of RIMFAX showing us um, how it takes this ground penetrating radar. It looks for uh, changes in the dielectric constant. What that means is material changes probably um, or porosity or maybe even ice, subsurface ice, if it's there. Um, those layers will cause the radar to bounce off those layers and um, return that signal to us so that we can see what the subsurface is made out of with RIMFAX. Next slide, please. What, what we call proximity science is when we use the arm instruments to get up close to a rock and really dig into what that rock is made out of. This is more akin to putting a, a sample into a microprobe or something like that. Um, so on the right hand side, what you see here are different sized boxes that correspond to the footprint of these uh, instruments that we're going to be able to use. So that orange bounding box, the, the one that goes all the way around, that's about three millimeters across. Um, that's about the footprint size of the SuperCam infrared that's up on the mast. So it's going to look at this spot and it's going to give us an infrared spectrum that integrates over all these um, over all these minerals. This uh, what I'm showing you is a basaltic shergatite that's a kind of Martian meteorite. And that's just a proxy there for what you might expect to see in terms of grain size for an igneous rock on Mars. Um, inside the white box that's about two millimeters big, that's about the footprint of um, the Raman and um, the visible infrared, the visible spectrometer on SuperCan, again, up on the mass looking down. And then we can put um, spots down, those yellow boxes, um, those are laser ablation spots, the size of a laser ablation spot that we can get with the LIBS on SuperCam. So each one of those spots would be a laser ablation and it would tell us the elemental makeup of everything in that box. Um, in the blue boxes and the pink boxes, these little tiny ones, those tell us about how close those arm instruments can get, how fine a resolution they can get on this rock. And you can see that the blue boxes, which are um, pixel, which is our elemental spectroscopy, and the pink boxes, which are Sherlock, which is our Raman spectroscopy or fluorescence, um, those are the size of uh, individual minerals in some cases. Um, so all of these work together. We'll be able to um, abrade the rock. We'll be able to get an image that's much like the image that you see here. We'll be able to tell the grain size and the porosity. And then all of these instruments work together to tell us what those minerals are, how they're put together. And from that, we infer the history of the rock and the history of the planet. Um, next slide, please. Detecting ancient life signs, here's another example of a stromatolite and it's cut in cross sections so that you can see its layers. Um, down here on the left is an example of stromatolites right now um, in Shark Bay, Australia. Um, they're little mounding structures, like I said, they're uh, um, formed by microbial mats that trap sediment and so they gradually build up as they trap that sediment. And those layers that are left behind are diagnostic of the mats that were once there. The mats are no longer there, um, but as they decay in place, um, we can take an image. You can see the, the gray box here is an image of about a, two millimeters across um, where it shows these layers. And here's um, Pixel and Sherlock data from the test bed on Earth of that microbial mat system. Um, you can see the layers in Pixel. Um, there's silicon, calcium, and iron. So you can see how the sediment that gets trapped is silica sand that's been trapped by the microbial lights and then the uh, microbial mats have been fossilized um, with calcium. Um, that's from the seawater where they take it in and then it turns into calcite. On the right hand side, Sherlock, which gives us our fluorescence spectrometry, 
quartz carbonate and that green is kerogen. Kerogen is an organic material that's left behind by the decay of those organisms. So those organisms are no longer alive, but this is what we call a biosignature. Um, so the, you can see those are correlated to right over those sand traps. Those are the remains of those microbes. So that's the kind of thing that Perseverance is looking for. I don't think anyone on the team expects that we're going to see a cross section of a stromatolite with this kind of data, but these are the kinds of capabilities that we have that we'll be looking for in these rocks. Next slide, please. Preparing for humans, uh, as I said, is an important thing. It's something that encompasses um, all of NASA and brings together our space technology, our human exploration, and our science mission directorates. So META is an, a set of environmental sensors. This is a weather report from the Mars InSight mission, but we'll be generating something very similar where we have air temperature, pressure, wind speed, um, humidity, um, radiation, uh, all these things that work together to understand what the environment is like and how to design our systems for humans. And then MOXIE uh, is a demonstration of technologies to enable us to refine um, the chemicals out of the air and turn them into things that we want to use, specifically oxygen. So oxygen can be used to breathe, of course. It can be used to make rocket fuel. It can be used to combine with hydrogen to make drinkable water. So MOXIE is collecting the CO2 from the Martian atmosphere. The Martian atmosphere is dominantly CO2, which we can't breathe. Um, and so it's going to collect that. It's going to uh, acquire it, compress it, um, use solid state electrolysis to turn it into oxygen, um, measure the composition of that gas, and then it's going to let it right back out into the atmosphere. So it'll exhaust um, carbon, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and oxygen as it breaks that down. Um, so that's something that we, uh, that human exploration is really interested in using um, in a bigger scale for humans on, on Mars. And so we're going to test that out with MOXIE. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, sample collection. Uh, as we drive around, we're going to be identifying the rocks. We're going to be identifying the biosignatures um, as best as we can with our onboard payload. And then we're going to choose the ones to sample. The way we sample is we uh, drive around, we leave a cache on the ground. Um, and then a future mission, and Brendan will talk about these, we'll, we'll go um, and pick up those samples, um, put them on board, and launch them back to the Earth. Um, next slide, please. So I hope you get to follow Perseverance as we explore, as we do our in-situ analyses, and as we collect our samples. Uh, and thanks, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Great, okay. Uh, morning, everyone. I'm Brendan Fian. Uh, I'm uh, the project systems engineer for Goddard's component of the Mars Sample Return mission. Uh, which is called uh, CCRS, or the Capture, Containment, and Return System. Uh, so the project system engineer is uh, equivalent to a mission system engineer, which uh, is a phrase we use maybe a little bit more at Goddard, but uh, that means I, I coordinate the engineering activities of, of the team uh, that's, that's uh, executing this part of the project, and including working all the internal and external interfaces and allocating requirements and that type of thing. Uh, we're, I should say before we go to the next chart that we're early in the mission so that uh, the images you'll see today for these elements of Mars sample return are conceptual. Our first design reviews are in about a year uh, for this part of the project that I'll be explaining. So you could go to the next chart, please. Um, so there are a lot of elements of Mars sample return, uh, the Perseverance rover, which we, we just heard about, and then the, the two in the middle are active developments now uh, led by the program office at JPL with participation uh, from across the agency and internationally. So the two key, those two key pieces are the sample retrieval lander, which is going to launch in 2026. Uh, that includes uh, a small rover that uh, goes out to fetch the cached samples and includes a Mars ascent vehicle that launches this orbiting sample container, this canister into Mars orbit. And the other element is the Earth return orbiter, uh, and that is uh, that's the component that Goddard's contributing to uh, that contains the capture uh, or includes the capture containment and return system that's also launching in 2026. Uh, if you could click once on that chart, uh, I yeah, thank you. Okay, great. 
Uh, so Goddard is leading that CCRS payload. That is the payload on the ESA provided uh, spacecraft. And that includes significant contributions from other centers. In total, the Mars Sample Return mission includes, you know, it relies on the combined efforts of eight NASA centers plus ESA. And there's a significant ESA contribution beyond the spacecraft that we're riding on, the Earth Return Orbiter, on the Sample Retrieval Lander. ESA is contributing the Fetch rover and contributing some of the robotic systems that move the, uh, the samples and package the samples for launch from Mars. Uh, we could go ahead to the next chart, please. So this is just an overview of that ERO spacecraft that our Goddard payload is, is riding on. And I'm, I'm not gonna talk about this in detail other than to point out the size. So if you look at the scale at the top, this is 39 meters uh, stem to stern. So it's a, a very large solar array system that powers an electric propulsion system that's highlighted in the image on the left. Uh, the, uh, the, the main uh, challenge of building this system for ESA is that it has to make a round trip uh, to Mars and back. So that requires a lot of propellants and uh, quite a bit of time. Uh, and some other tricks that we play to, uh, to preserve the mission timeline, including the uh, what's labeled at the bottom, the biprop transit stage, that's a chemical propulsion stage that gets us into Mars orbit that's dropped off there to save mass on the way back. And in fact, part of our system, part of our CCRS system is dropped off in Mars orbit to save mass as well. Uh, if you could go to the next chart, please. So this is an overview of CCRS. Um, the, the main functions are to capture that orbiting sample container. And uh, if you look at the image on the right, that's a little bit out of scale. Uh, just imagine that that, uh, that canister that looks like a propane tank and is about the size of a propane tank uh, is closer to you than the rest of the system. Uh, that's just to, to show a bit of detail. But uh, So the spacecraft does the rendezvous and we open a door and capture it. And uh, critical to this mission, and this is unique or a first of its kind for uh, human exploration of the solar system, uh, <clears throat> there uh, we're in a, a special category for planetary protection. So planetary protection typically for NASA missions means we're trying to keep, uh, prevent Earth biology from getting to uh, another body in the solar system that, uh, that, that needs to be protected. It, we have what we're calling backward planetary protection uh, for this mission, uh, which means that we're, we, we need to ensure that any potential Martian biology that may exist is uh, we're protecting Earth from it. Uh, so what that means is that we have to be very careful with uh, returning the samples in a, in a way that's contained. So we've called that whole process break the chain, which refers to breaking the chain of contact between a Mars biology uh, potential Mars biology and the Earth biosphere. Uh, that gives us our driving requirements for CCRS and uh, why it's so uh, such a large complicated system compared to other sample return missions. So uh, we've broken up, uh, I guess I should say that the, the other functions of the capture containment and return system, we are providing the uh, return capsule that will return the samples to Earth at the Utah Test and Training Range in uh, 2031. Uh, so part of our function, uh, we, we physically capture and constrain that orbiting sample, and then we uh, redundantly contain it in a manner that uh, separates any or contains any dust that's on the exterior of that original canister that came from Mars. Uh, so that's uh, sealed, and we prevent any dust transport from the uh, portion of our system where that uh, where dust might be transported. So we prevent any of that dust from getting back uh, into the return capsule. And uh, that involves some uh, fairly complex mechanisms. And also one of the containment vessels is brazed shut in Mars orbit. So that's a technology development we've been working on for quite some time. Uh, so the brazing effectively combines two functions. One is it contains the sample and the other is any dust that might remain uh, gets sterilized uh, via the brazing process so that we have a clean uh, contained uh, canister that we're passing through uh, to put in the return capsule. Uh, that return capsule we call the Earth Entry Vehicle. Uh, that's 
got a, a thermal protection system on it that's carbon phenolic as a heat shield, and we also provide uh, micrometeorite protection. That's another unique element of the system compared to other sample return missions uh, where this hasn't been as much of a concern. We need to ensure that the thermal protection system is not damaged and that any damage that does happen, we can detect. And the reason for that is prior to release of the capsule for Earth return, uh, we need to ensure that it's maintained its de in designed integrity uh, so that it will uh, land successfully. Uh, we can't tolerate any uh, significant chance of breakup of the capsule uh, once it hits the atmosphere uh, because we need to contain the, the sample material. Uh, and there are, uh, of course, other requirements to ensure that the sample integrity is preserved. So we uh, manage things like temperature and the load environment that the samples are exposed to. Uh, and I, I should say another, another key difference here is uh, compared to other sample return missions, which uh, you've seen, I think there was a Japanese one uh, that landed last month, those have had parachutes. And uh, the, the evaluation that was made early on is that the risk of a failure in a parachute system was too great. And we had an experience at NASA with that uh, several years ago where a parachute failed to deploy and the, the capsule uh, suffered some significant damage when it landed. So we went ahead and removed the parachute and designed the system to uh, to have the integrity to land without the parachute. So that's uh, made it quite a bit more robust. Uh, if you go through one more click. OK, so this this is a different view of the same system, and it shows what I've labeled clean zone means it's clean of Mars materials. So that barrier is uh, something that we maintain to keep. There's kind of a, a dirty side where uh, that's the capture side where we expect some Mars dust to be uh, bouncing around. And in the center, there's a bulkhead where we do the brazing operation and effectively separate uh, any area that's exposed to Mars material from area that's not. Um, if you go through one more click and hit play, there's a, a brief video that I'll try to narrate. Uh, so there's a, a view of the system concept. And when the capture door opens, there's a sensor grid uh, that activates that determines when the sample uh, has actually entered and completed its entry into our cavity, and we shut the door to keep it from bouncing out and to contain all the dust. There's a cutaway view here that shows the mechanisms that constrain it, and then we orient it. Uh, it it's symmetric, but there is a, a, an upside down configuration we want to avoid, and that's because of the design of the sample tubes themselves. So we want to land them in the right orientation. So we detect which way it's pointed and reorient it, and then moving move it into this brazing station. And that's a clever design with a, a double lid that allows us to preserve the integrity of the bulkhead simultaneously while we encapsulate the canister uh, in a, a containment vessel. And we have a robotic system that moves that into the earth entry vehicle and assembles the rest of that. So this is kind of a Russian nesting doll with, with uh, various levels of containers and they all have a, a, a purpose to contain the samples and then protect it for the uh, the landing environment. Uh, after we're, we're done with that, we close out this uh, earth entry compartment and we jettison the, uh, the portion of the system that we no longer need. And that's done in Mars orbit. So that makes us a, a lot lighter uh, for the return trip. Uh, and then we separate when we get close to, to Earth, we separate the capsule uh, for return. You could go to the next chart when that completes. So this is just an expanded view of the capture and containment module, uh, showing the various elements of the system that I, I won't go through in detail. But um, you can see that the packaging of the system is, has been one of the uh, uh, one of the constraints, and, and we've gone through a lot of interesting design trades to make sure that everything fits within our allowable envelope and our mass limit. Uh, and it still has the performance. And, and we do have a, a, a bunch of cameras uh, throughout that I guess aren't explicitly required for engineering purposes uh, other than to confirm that things are happening. But uh, it won't be quite as exciting as pictures from another planet, but we do expect um, some visuals from our system's performance when the time comes. Uh, you could go to the next chart, please. So this is a cutaway view of uh, part of the Earth return module that shows uh, the capsule, the earth entry vehicle, which I've labeled, and then the shell around it, uh, the micrometeoroid shield uh, that 
protects uh, the system against micrometeorite damage so that opens as you saw in the video and there's a, a spin eject mechanism that uh, spins up the capsule and uh, ejects it simultaneously in one operation and that it's spun so it's stable in free flight uh, between its separation point and, and hitting the atmosphere. Okay, so you could go to the next chart. So that was uh, the CCRS is Goddard's contribution. So we're managing uh, that project and the engineering of all the subsystems. Some of the subsystems are contributed by other centers. Uh, Langley is responsible for that earth entry vehicle. Ames builds the thermal protection system and JPL is building a few of the mechanisms for us. But uh, I wanted to, uh, just give you a view and of you know, kind of back out to what the overall Mars sample return architecture looks like. And it is quite large with a lot of contributions. So all the complexity that I discussed and is implied by what I discussed, if you click one more time, pre, I think I've just circled, all of that is contained in that green oval. Uh, and there is uh, at least equivalent complexity in the rest of the system. And you can see that we rely on to make this mission happen, three launches from Earth, one launch from Mars. And uh, this is somewhat color coded to show the contributions from ESA and the uh, contributions from the NASA side. Uh, so it's uh, quite an intricate endeavor. I, I will say that one of the things that we've tried to architect in this system is a lot of robustness such that uh, if any piece of it is delayed, we have flexibility to uh, manage the rest of the, the mission. Uh, so the Earth return orbiter and the sample re retrieval lander are projected and uh, planned to launch both in 2026. But um, say if the Earth return orbiter gets there first, uh, we can loiter in Mars orbit for a, a long period of time. And if the sample retrieval lander, uh, similarly, uh, they can perform their mission and launch the sample into Mars orbit, and we can pick it up later if necessary. So there is some uh, robustness built in. Uh, go ahead to the next chart, and I think that's my summary. So the, the challenge here, uh, the, the primary engineering challenge, uh, uh, typically for a sample return mission, protect the samples from the Earth. And that starts with perseverance, uh, with extraordinarily clean sample tubes in the sample collection system. And those are hermetically sealed at Mars. Uh, we're not going to the surface, so we don't have quite as stringent requirements on our system from, a, from our perspective. But protecting the Earth from the samples uh, is uh, new territory for, for NASA and for the uh, sample return community globally. So this is the first restricted Earth return mission. Uh, samples from uh, specific bodies in the solar system that have been identified as potentially harboring life or ancient life are in that category, so Mars. Uh, Europa and Enceladus, uh, but that that puts a lot of requirements on us for those redundant containment vessels that we're robotically assembling in Mars orbit, and a, a passive uh, return vehicle that doesn't have a parachute, and that's for reliability. So there's uh, no moving parts, no active systems on that return capsule, which means we have to uh, design it to perform uh, kind of no matter what in a in a very robust set of conditions uh, because it's impacting it. Uh, something on the order of 40 meters a second or uh, between 90 and 100 miles an hour. Uh, so that, that system is designed to take that impact and absorb the impact and protect the samples. So that's uh, kind of a quick summary of what engineering challenge is required to get this quantum leap of returning a piece of another planet back to Earth. And that about wraps it up for me. I think we could go on to the next speaker. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. It's real, real pleasure to be here to talk about something that I know I've been thinking about uh, for decades, uh, actually bringing samples back from Mars. Just a tremendous amount of science we can learn if we can get these, these cores back on Earth. One of my roles on the MSR campaign is uh, I'm a sample integrity scientist, so I'm paying attention to issues like trying not to overheat the sample or expose it to magnetic fields and uh, certainly keep it from being contaminated so that we can really maximize the science uh, when they're back here on Earth. I'm also part of a, a sample planning group. So um, there's an international group of scientists, um, including myself, that are already planning for what we're going to do with these samples when they're returned to Earth, how they're handled and curated, uh, and some of the initial analyses and um, uh, you know how we're going to distribute them uh, worldwide. Next step. 
So Barbara did a good job explaining about some of the, the, the main science objectives for uh, perseverance. Uh, these are the Mars exploration goals. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on goal one, which is trying to figure out whether or not Mars ever supported life um, uh, and potentially even still could support life. Uh, so this is an exciting question. I know that uh, you know many of us have been asking this. Uh, where do we come from? Um, some people have suggested we're all, in fact, Martians, and I'll talk about that uh, in a bit. So some exciting um, questions here that, that really uh, can only be answered uh, by sample return. Next slide. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about what we know from Mars uh, from previous missions. Um, the Viking missions, NASA successfully put two landers on the surface of Mars, about 4,000 miles apart, uh, carrying the first life detection uh, uh, instrument package, uh, this biology experiment. And one of them gave a positive result. Uh, it's still debated today. This is the labeled release experiment. So what they did is they basically added a nutrient solution to scoop soil. Uh, containing organic uh, compounds uh, that were labeled with uh, uh, carbon-14, and they were looking for evidence of metabolic activity. The idea being that if there are any microbes in the soil, it would basically uh, eat the food, eat the nutrients uh, for energy, and then release byproducts such as uh, carbon dioxide. And by golly, you know, they, they observed this signal uh, shown there in the bottom right, the scoop soil in the in the red dots there, uh, radioactive uh, carbon-14 labeled CO2. Um, and also they noted that when they had heat sterilized the soil prior to adding nutrients at 160 C, designed to kill any microbes, they didn't see a signal. So again, um, you know, the original authors, Gil Levin and Pat Strat, even to this day, maintain that this was, this was uh, evidence for, for biology in the near surface. Uh, we now know that Mars is a very oxidizing environment. Um, there are chemicals like uh, potentially hypochlorite. Uh, sodium hypochlorite is, is bleach, uh, which we know can react rapidly with organics uh, and also produce, um, oxidize them and produce a CO2. I think most people think that the explanation for this result is chemical, but we really don't know for sure. Um, if you go to the next step, Sample return will help us answer this question. Um, uh, Perseverance has a regolith bit that can collect some of the soil and bring it back to Earth. So it'll be really exciting to, to get to the bottom of this and figure out what is really going on. Next step. Uh, this was uh, kind of personally exciting for me. Uh, many of you probably remember the the, the evidence for life and uh, Martian Murad Allen Hills 8401 announcement by Dave McKay and others at Johnson Space Center back in 1996. This announcement actually got me into astrobiology. Uh, I'm a physicist by training um, and just the excitement generated over this potential discovery was enough to suck me in and uh, start learning chemistry uh, to get to the bottom of this. But this is, uh, Allen Hills is a potato-sized uh, igneous rock. What makes it uh, really special is its age. It's very old, uh, over four billion years. So it was present on Mars during a time when we think Mars was uh, much more habitable. Uh, it was ejected from Mars by an impact about 16 million years ago and then landed in Antarctica 13,000 years ago before it was discovered by a team of uh, meteorite hun hunters from the ANSMET program. And really all the action is uh, in these carbonates, uh, these amber colored globules about 3.9 billion years old uh, formed in the presence of liquid water. They, they found these magnetite grains that look like magnetotactic bacteria on the earth, these, these worm-like fossils. And of course, uh, organic compounds, these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which they claimed were the remnants of uh, biology. Now, each one of these lines of evidence has an alternate hypothesis that's been proposed that they're non-biological in origin. And so they've kind of been shot down, if you will, uh, one by one. But 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 still, you know, this is this was the possibility that this could actually be Martian life is, is, is still exciting, even to this day. And if you go to the next step. I do want to emphasize one of the issues um, uh, with meteorites in general, including Allen Hills, is that they all get contaminated um, by terrestrial organic material and biology after they hit the atmosphere and land on Earth. And again, this is one of the drivers for Mars sample return and why it's so important to go there, collect samples in a clean way and bring them back protected from the Earth's environment so we can really try to figure out uh, whether or not there are these ancient signs of life. Next slide. 
There are other limitations of Mars, Martian meteorites. I won't go through these in detail, but most of the Mars meteorites we have are igneous volcanic rocks. Okay, They're not sedimentary rocks uh, like what we'll encounter in Jezero Crater with Perseverance. We want to bring those samples back because they're the most likely to preserve um, chemical signs of life. Um, next step. They also lack context, and Barbara alluded to this as well in her talk, but we don't, we've never identified any source craters for any of these meteorites, uh, so they cannot be used to construct a complete geological timeline of Mars, which is all relative. And I know uh, Barbara's just itching to get one of these igneous rocks back from uh, Jezero Crater so that we can get an absolute age of it and, and, and really pin down uh, the chronology of Mars, which is really exciting. Next step. There's also a bias sampling of rock ages. Um, most of the Martian meteorites we have, which is by I think a week ago, I counted over 290 Mars meteorites. Most are young with ages less than two and a half billion years. We really want the old rocks uh, to answer this question about life, you know, four billion year old rocks. This is uh, around the time that we think life may have started on Earth, potentially could have started on Mars. So we're really interested in, in, in getting that material. And the sedimentary rocks, of course. Uh, so the ancient sedimentary rocks that could preserve evidence of the chemistry going on uh, around that time is just really important. Next step. And then finally, you know, these Mars meteorites, they're, they're, they're ejected from Mars by, by high energy impacts, right, from other objects. Um, and this can alter the samples, uh, especially some of the organic compounds that we're looking for as signs of life. These can be destroyed by, by heat and, and shock. Next slide. Okay, this was this was a really exciting discovery uh, made by the, the sample analysis at Mars team um, on Curiosity. SAM is an instrument that was built, designed, tested uh, right here at Goddard. Paul Mahaffey is the PI. And Jen Igerbrod published a, a really great paper in Science a few years back. And this was the, the first evidence of uh, organic compounds in the Martian near surface. So Curiosity landed in Gale Crater, which is another crater lake uh, like Jezero. And in those mudstones, by golly, we found these organic compounds, and that had had never been confirmed before. Um, prior to this mission, you know, a lot of scientists like myself thought that most of the organics would be destroyed by ionizing radiation because Mars, uh, unlike the Earth, doesn't have a magnetic field to shield itself from that stuff. And these these ionizing radiation, the gamma rays can can penetrate, you know, down several feet. Um, but uh, what we've shown here with Curiosity is that uh, organics can be preserved in these sediments despite that radiation. And this really provided a lot of the, the science motivation and justification really for the current Mars sample return strategy of returning near surface rocks from Jezero. So just very exciting and an important discovery. Next slide. Okay, there are other reasons why sample studies are important. Um, one is the way we can process and handle the sample. Um, uh, it amazes me what Perseverance is able to do with just coring a rock and, and sealing it. Um, but, you know, we want to go beyond that. We want to be able to make thin sections of, of rocks. We want to be able to tease out individual mineral grains and even slice up individual mineral, mineral grains. We want to be able to do solvent extraction, wet chemistry. Uh, we have labs here on Earth that can do all that in order to really go after and interrogate these potential biosignatures, really investigate the molecular structures, uh, the isotopic ratios of indiv individual co compounds, uh, chirality, which is a unique unique property of life as we know it here on Earth. All uh, proteins and enzymes are based on the left-handed form of amino acids, for example. So we want to do this, and that takes significant sample processing steps that, that are difficult to do uh, in situ, but we can do them easily here in the lab. Next slide. And then, of course, we have all the state-of-the-art in instruments here, right? Um, technologies that, that, that can't be flown on spaceflight missions, uh, a range of instrumentation. Some, like the, the synchrotron beamline, is the size of a building, I mean, uh, uh, to make these measurements. So just a tremendous amount of capability here on Earth that's, that's just difficult. We can't, we can't bring this stuff to Mars. We've got to bring Mars to us. Next slide. Okay, one hypothesis that's out there is uh, called panspermia. You might have heard this, but the idea that the planets could have seeded each other with life. Some have suggested that uh, prior to Mars going dry and cold, uh, life originated there first. And, um, you know, a, a spore or a bacteria hitchhiked on a meteorite from Mars and seeded the Earth. And therefore, maybe we're all Martian uh, in origin. That's, that's, that's a hypothesis that's been proposed. And sample return can, can help us answer this question. Which is pretty exciting. Next slide. 
Okay, so there are four possible search for life outcomes. Um, uh, the first one is that we don't find any organic material. Um, I personally think this is highly unlikely uh, based on what we know from Martian meteorites and also the curiosity measurements in Gale Crater that have shown that there are organic compounds in their surface. And of course, Perseverance uh, has, has the tools to also look for organic compounds and select samples, which, which may have organics as well. Next step. Uh, another possibility is that we find organic matter, but it's not from biology, right? It was created by non-biological reactions. Um, this is a possibility. Um, I would argue that this would be fascinating in and of itself because it would help us advance our understanding of prebiotic chemistry in a habitable environment around the same time that, that life evolved on Earth. So we could learn something about how life may have started. Next step. And then we get to some of the more interesting findings here. We do find uh, organic biosignatures, you know, amino acids, uh, nucleobases, uh, and they look like terrestrial biology. So provided we can convince ourselves that we didn't bring that stuff there, which is uh, really a, a concern with contamination we're paying attention to, this would be a fantastic discovery uh, and maybe would uh, support the hypothesis of panspermia indicating that a uh, common origin of life uh, that happened in our solar system, um, but potentially life is still rare, right? Because it would be a single origin in that case. And then the last possibility, and this is the baseball equivalent of, of a grand slam discovery here. If we, if we found this, this would be simply amazing. So maybe we find amino acids or, uh, or chemical building blocks that, that are different than the, the 20 amino acids we have in life or uh, opposite chirality, um, which would imply two independent origins of life, at least in our solar system, right? Um, and this would just simply put mean that uh, extraterrestrial life is not rare um, and should be ubiquitous. Next slide. Okay, so I want to talk briefly here about some of the capabilities we have here at Goddard in the laboratory. This is the Goddard Astrobiology Analytical Lab. The focus of this lab is looking at extraterrestrial organic compounds um, in meteorites and sample return materials. Of course, we're, we're really excited about uh, OSIRIS-REx and analyzing some of that material. Um, I'll point out that most of what we look at is uh, non-biological in order, origin. It's uh, organic chemistry that happened prior to the origin of life. And it's actually really important that we understand this in our search for evidence of life elsewhere. Uh, we want to avoid false positives. So we want to understand all the possibilities for making some of these building blocks of life that don't require biology. And so if some, we see something that sticks out uh, and we can't explain, then, then that would be really exciting. Um, there's more capability here at Goddard. The next slide. We've just got a tremendous amount of expertise here um, with respect to uh, Mars sample return related uh, science, uh, both in the planetary environments lab, uh, code 6099, where they've uh, of course developed SAM. I've also built the MoMA instrument that will be on the ExoMars rover uh, launching in 2022 that will look for evidence of life in the subsurface. Uh, one of the neat things that, that we're doing in this lab is we're uh, basically looking at the data from Mars. We've got a, a, a whole suite of laboratory analytical instruments that can be used uh, to test Mars analogs to help us better interpret the results. And this is really exciting. I think the message here is that, you know, we're going to learn stuff from the samples returned from Jezero. And we'll be able to tie it to some of these other sites on Mars, like Gale Crater and um, the ExoMars uh, landing location, and really make sense of that data. And just to give you a quick example of the importance of this, um, from the Curiosity data analysis, uh, we actually went back and looked at some of the old Viking data. Viking gas chromatography mass spectrometry data, and we're able to discover an organic compound that that team had not discovered um, just by the knowledge that we gained in Gale. So uh, really, really powerful uh, here. And then I also want to mention the, the uh, code 698, the Planetary Geology, Geophysics, and Geochemistry Laboratory. We're doing a lot of field work. Uh, Barb Cohen's got a, a really cool noble gas geochronology lab uh, where they're studying meteorites and, and lunar samples and, and hopefully Mars samples uh, when they're returned. Um, and I'll point out that the, the GIF, the Goddard um, uh, Instrument Field Team, is, is, is really a neat way to kind of do your own sample return mission here right on Earth, right? We go out to these Mars analog sites, return samples to the lab, uh, and investigate them using the state-of-the-art instruments. So again, a lot of expertise here at Goddard that, that, that we'll bring to bear uh, when the samples are returned from Jezero. Next slide. 
And then I'll just leave you with this. You know, we focus a lot on the science uh, that we're going to learn, and of course, the engineering uh, and the technology developments that are enabled by uh, Mars Sample Return, but uh, to prepare for human, which is all great. And um, I, I really can't overestimate, though, the, the last part of this, the inspiration. Um, and how these missions inspire uh, the next generation. I was listening to the Perseverance um, briefing yesterday with a video, and there was an 11-year-old girl from Ireland who called in and said, you know, what can I do now? I, I want to be involved in Mars sample return. I want to analyze these rocks, you know, 11 years old. And, you know, she'll probably be able to do that, right? We'll have these samples back, and that's one of the benefits of sample return is that these samples will be archived and made available for, for generations of scientists. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you all so much for listening. Thank you all for your wonderful presentations. Um, great job. And uh, we do have lots of questions in the chat box. Um, so I will start going through them. Um, for those of you watching, uh, thank you for, for staying with us this long. We may run a few minutes over so we can try and get to uh, as many questions as possible. Um, but we do understand if you have to leave us, um, and this has been recorded and, and you can watch it uh, later on at this site too. Um, so Brendan, a lot of the questions are actually uh, for you, at least the questions we have so far. Um, so there's a lot of interest in the brazing process, you know, exactly how will that work? Um, one question and uh, specifically says, is the flux and brass pre-positioned around the container or is it robotically inserted in the puddle? Yes, so the 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 uh, brazing uh, the brazed material is pre-populated in that containment vessel, and right now one of the, the uh, investigations we're we're going through, uh, we're doing a lot of early testing with uh, coupons with subscale uh, containment vessels to test out brazing. We're doing that in air, and also uh, we have plans to do that in vacuum, and we're doing drop testing of the brazed samples to make sure they ma maintain their mechanical integrity and doing leak checks. To, to, measure their hermeticity. The, one of the investigations we're, we're going through right now is to determine exactly what alloy we're going to use as the brace material. So that's that's certainly not settled yet. Uh, that's driven in part by what our needs are mechanically and also what uh, the needs are for sterilizing to ensure that we sterilize uh, the brace seal. Great, thank you. Um, another question for you is related to the um, the actual capturing of the sample container after it launches from Mars. Um, so how will the ERO roll over the sample in precisely the right way to contain it? And how do you keep the container from bouncing out during capture? Those are great questions. So uh, the ERO, uh, well, first, it, this process actually starts with the uh, rocket, the Mars Ascent vehicle that launches the sample from the Mars surface. So uh, we are, in an orbital position where we can observe that launch from the ERO platform and we get telemetry from the launch vehicle uh, to give us a, a good set of uh, input ephemeris. And uh, ESA has uh, some experience with rendezvous uh, going back many years based on space stations. So they're modifying some algorithms to do the orbit matching part of this. But the orbiting sample itself uh, has no transponder, uh, no beacon, uh, but we get that input ephemeris and there are a set of cameras on the spacecraft that uh, uh, kind of zoom lens cameras, if you will, that uh, will pick up optically the, the sample. Uh, that's going to be a pretty bright object against the background. It'll be fairly reflective. So they pick it up optically and uh, go through a long sequence of rendezvous. The advantage we have is we can take our time doing that and get good orbital data on the target. Uh, so essentially the, the spacecraft will perform the rendezvous when we're close, and when I say close, within a kilometer, there's a LIDAR system, uh, so an active detection system where we're bouncing light off of the, the sample so we get not just its range, but its uh, velocity information and tumbling rate information. So that's used for the uh, close-in rendezvous, and this is not a continuous process. So essentially the spacecraft can uh, perform a series of maneuvers, but between each maneuver we can pause and collect more data. So the last step, the, uh, the orbiting sample will be a couple of meters away from the spacecraft. And at that point, we open our door uh, and turn on our sensors. And essentially the spacecraft, uh, it 
you could use the analogy of a catcher's mitt, but it's kind of the other way around. If you imagine the ball is is stationary in space relatively, and the, the catcher's mitt moves into it, that's effectively how the system will work. And we have uh, a s several layers of sensors within our system, basically an LED curtain, to detect when the sample canister passes through and when it's fully contained, and then we slam the door shut to ensure that it's not bouncing out. We also have a mechanism uh, to constrain it that deploys at the same time, so we have two ways of, of keeping it from from bouncing out. I will say if it uh, if it were to bounce out or we got our targeting wrong and it bounces off another piece of the spacecraft, we can try again, presuming nothing's damaged. So uh, we have some robustness in the system, but that's that's essentially how it's how it's designed to work. Great, thank you. Um, and Barbara, the next question is for you. So on the map that you showed for sample collection, is there a rough idea of when Perseverance would get to each of those locations? Yeah, what I showed was um, just a cartoon. It wasn't a map. Um, we don't actually have a traverse uh, planned and sample locations identified yet. That's something that's still on our plate to do. Um, we hope that the first sample um, to collect will be in early summer is the last I heard. Um, we have a lot of engineering checkout to do to get both our instruments and our coring system ready. Um, but it turns out that uh, where we landed is a really um, a site of high interest for the scientists. So I hope that we'll be seeing uh, coring happen as soon as we're ready with the rover. Great, thank you. Uh, and Danny, this next question is for you. Um, are you concerned that humans going to Mars will introduce organic contamination of the pristine Mars environment that will confuse or even disable future studies of Martian organics and potential life? Yeah, I mean, that that is a real concern. I mean, that's one of the drivers for wanting to do Mars sample return robotically, right, before we send humans there. That being said, I will say that, you know, we do look for life here on Earth with humans. Uh, we drill down deep into Antarctica and, 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 and we can still find some interesting evidence of life despite our own contamination. So uh, the risk is there, but it's not impossible. Um, eventually, we're going to send humans there, so we're going to have to figure it out. We may need them, frankly, to drill deep and, and get to areas on Mars that have the highest potential for finding life. So uh, we're going to have to figure it out. Great. Um, let's see. And I will let Danny also answer this question, but Barbara, do please feel free to jump in. Uh, will there be enough sample mass to tease out isotopic abundances? Yeah, that, that's, I guess it depends on what, what compound you're measuring, right? Uh, we certainly know there's a lot of water uh, in all the samples that we've measured with Curiosity. I'm sure Jezero Crater samples will be the same. And so we'll be able to measure D-to-H ratios, oxygen isotope ratios of water. If you're talking about trace organic compounds, that's that's kind of an open question, right? Depends on the abundance. So if we find some trace part per billion levels of amino acids, that could be challenging to measure the isotope ratio. So that's why it's important to, to get as much of these cores back as we can and, and more mass is always better, <laughs> there's no question. I don't know if you wanna say a few words, Bob. <laughs> yeah, and for radiogenic isotopes, um, again, it depends on what the samples are and what their mineralogy is and what their composition is. I mean, we'll do the best we can with the onboard instruments to um, be able to uh, give the laboratories a heads up about what might be possible with them so that when they come back, um, we can split them and allocate them to the labs that are most likely to um, get good results. Um, but we're certainly hoping to do stable isotopes and radiogenic isotopes on these samples as well. I think there are about 30 grams each of sample. And our last question, um, since we are already over time, is how do we know a meteorite is from Mars? What is the age based on? It's a good question for you, Barb. <laughs> sure. Um, so meteorites, uh, when they land on the Earth, um, we know they're meteorites by a couple different methods. One is that they have a glassy fusion crust um, that we know came from their uh, travels to the atmosphere. Um, but another way is when we look at their oxygen isotopes. So oxygen has isotopes 16, 17, and 18, different masses of the same element. Um, and the ratio of oxygen 16, 17, and 18 to each other fingerprints the planet 
um, from which the rocks came. It's a really useful property of the solar system. Um, and so meteorites um, that have uh, an oxygen ratio different from Earth, we know, are, come from a different planet. The Martian meteorites, we knew, had a different oxygen isotope ratio. And uh, when we had the capability to measure trapped gases in one of those meteorites, it exactly matched the Viking uh, measurements of the Martian atmosphere. So there's a couple different ways that we link Martian meteorites to Mars. Mars itself. Um, and once we've linked them to Mars itself, then we can use radiogenic elements in the rock to get their radiometric age in the laboratory. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in today. Thank you to our presenters. You all did a great job. Um, I think we could definitely go on and on uh, all day with, uh, with hearing more about this. But the exciting thing is, this is all just starting. So Perseverance just landed. We have got years of exciting images and uh, data and science return to look forward to, as well as, of course, uh, the sample uh, caching um, and the development of the hardware and the, the missions and the spacecraft and the landers and everything that is going to be needed uh, for us to actually get the samples back to Earth. So lots of exciting steps ahead. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, I'm sure we will do uh, more of these types of sessions uh, in the coming years to you know, as again, we ramp up the, uh, the Mars sample return effort. Uh, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.